The sea covers three quarters of the Earth's surface. In bygone centuries, men sailed it on long and difficult voyages of exploration and discovery, and so built up the patterns of trade on which our modern industrial society still depends. Today, a whole industry is putting out to sea, exploring the rocks beneath the seabed itself for new sources of oil and gas to provide our society with enough energy to ensure its future. Striking out for the first time beyond the shallow waters that surround our shores into the deep seas of the oceans themselves. For it is now clear that the land areas and inshore waters of the earth cannot provide us with enough oil to meet our future needs. We do not know how successful the search will be, only that this voyage too will be long and difficult. For many years now, the oil men have been established in ports and small harbors in various parts of the world, using them as construction and supply bases for the exploration of the continental shelf that surrounds our land areas. Wherever a study of the local geology has suggested that oil or natural gas might be present. The only way to find out for certain if there is oil in any given area and in commercial quantities is to drill a series of wells in the seabed. To do this economically, the drilling platforms must be mobile, as this one is. For drilling, it stands up on its three great legs, with the drilling platform well clear of the waves. But the drilling platform is built like a barge and can be lowered to the surface, the legs raised from the seabed and the rig towed away to another location. Once a field has been located and proved, it can be developed and the oil or gas produced, using platforms standing on steel towers fixed to the seabed. The steel frames of the towers are known as jackets. They are built lying horizontally and then towed out of the location and planted upright. This one has a height of about 260 feet and is about to be positioned on an oil field off the east coast of Spain. The North Sea gas fields are a typical example of the way these fixed platforms are used. They act as producing and gathering centers for a number of wells, and then the gas goes ashore through submarine pipelines. Already, 14% of the world's oil and gas supplies comes from offshore fields discovered in the waters of the continental shelf, usually within 50 miles of land. But with demand for energy doubling every 10 years, we've had to extend the search for new supplies into deeper waters, a long way further out. This is the North Sea, a hundred miles out from the Shetland Islands, and here things are different. The water is nearly 500 feet deep, so the rig can't stand on the bottom. It has to float. This is the shell rig stay flow, built for the North Sea. She's towed from one location to the next and then anchored in position. The anchor's being hauled a long way out and laid in a star-shaped pattern that will hold her in position in almost any weather.
The North Sea can often be horribly rough, with winds of up to 100 miles an hour and waves of 65 feet or more. In really bad weather, the deep oceans we are now exploring can produce winds of 150 miles an hour and waves 100 feet high. Seas like these cannot be tackled with rigs scaled to the shorter, choppier waters of the North Sea. They have to be bigger. This is the Ocean Prospector, drilling off the coast of Japan where the Typhoon is a regular visitor. She's bigger than Stayflo, but both rigs are built to the same pattern and maintain their stability by the same means and for the same reasons. The derrick itself is over 130 feet tall, equipped with heavy draw works. be as much as 150 tons of drill pipe stowed upright inside the derrick. And despite this, the rig must be kept stable enough to keep on drilling in almost any weather, if costly delays are to be avoided. For another thing, there has to be what's called a marine riser between the rig on the surface and the well on the seabed to circulate the special drilling mud used to control the pressures in the well, clean out the chippings and cool the bit. A trombone slide provides a flexible connection between the heaving rig and the fixed riser. Waves are the disturbance caused by wind friction at the surface. They affect anything floating on the surface or very close to it. Below the surface, their effect dies out rapidly the deeper we go. So the way the rig is stabilized is to make it semi-submersible, supporting the weight of the platform on pontoons floating well below the surface. The correct depth is achieved by ballasting the pontoons rather like a submarine until the right degree of buoyancy is arrived at. Then by spacing out the supporting legs, the surface waves can roll through with little or no effect. And so by using the semi-submersible principle and by scaling the platform to the scale of the seas, stability can be achieved. is more than just a hole in the ground. To most of us, oil on the loose spells pollution. To the men on the rig, it can spell deadly danger. For both reasons, the drilling process must be very carefully controlled. And so the well is lined with steel casing from top to bottom as drilling goes on. well strikes oil, it is just as carefully tested. As the rate of flow is measured, the oil is burned off to avoid polluting the sea. For the drillers, this is a moment of cautious triumph. The exploration well at least has struck oil. Even now, we're still a long way and many millions of pounds from having a producing oil field. Ahead of us lie problems that have never been encountered before, and there are no easy instant solutions. 
Ideas must be translated into reality slowly and carefully, step by step. First, more wells must be drilled to appraise the size of the field and to establish that the amount of oil in the ground will justify the enormous investment needed for production. It's possible to build jacket structures to a height of 700 feet or more. But when it comes to really deep water, anything from 1,000 to 6,000 feet, the production facility must either be located on the seabed or it must float. Ours floats. We call it SPA. This is a 15-foot model on test in a lake in Holland. The reality will be 450 feet tall. It is designed to float upright in much the same way as a fishing float, with the water line at the narrow neck near the top. Below the water line, the spar consists of a number of storage tanks, enough for about 300,000 barrels. Above the water line will be several decks for production equipment and accommodation, while at the very top, we have a large crane hoist and a helipad. The tankers that will take the oil ashore will be 50,000 tonnes. They moor head on to the spar and the crane hoist lowers a loading line to a loading valve up in the bows. The whole of the top deck is free to swivel through 360 degrees so that the tanker can always lie head on to the sea. The spar will remain anchored on station collecting the oil through flow lines from a number of wells, maybe hundreds of miles out at sea. Areas like the North Sea have certain advantages where work offshore is concerned. The whole industrial complex of Europe surrounds it. Major seaports abound. Here on shore, the companies have set up their local headquarters, assisted by a whole complex of support industries. Supply lines are conveniently short. Delivery to the rigs, regular and fast. Telecommunications abundant. Hello, Doug. It's uh, very much on the cars that we will be loading the subject shore with 50 tons oh, from it Look, uh, they've just come up with All 50 right. Georgia drill pipe again. Um, yes, that's I'll good. Have to I don't think we'll possibly be able to get this equipment on. We have the supply vessel standing by and uh, she could be steaming out uh, to I've the I've got platform. a helicopter lift off for you. I lifted off at 10.45. Do you want to take a note of the names, over? I've just got a weather report in here right now. And the rough weather's dying down. areas, men may be recruited locally and trained in all the skills of drilling and production, adapting quickly to a novel way of life and to novel ways of traveling. In effect, the industry is still working with one foot on dry land. Only the plant itself lies out to sea. But to satisfy demand for oil in the longer term, we must cast off from the shore and the shelf altogether, move out into deep water, and again explore. The areas of search are widely scattered, so now we need range as well as mobility. That calls for a ship. We may quite possibly find ourselves drilling in as much as 6,000 feet of water, far beyond anchor depth. That calls for a ship with a difference. This is the drilling ship Setco 445, capable of steaming at 14 knots over long distances and designed specifically for deep sea exploration. 
The 445 remains at sea for anything up to three months at a time, far from any supply port or supporting industries. Whatever she needs, she must take with her, from the breakfast eggs to the heaviest items of seabed equipment. All the scientific services normally based ashore must now sail in the ship, and so must management. It is on this basis that the 445 puts to sea. Her business is in deep waters. The area of search is determined by geological survey, allied to other factors ranging from water depths to concession agreements, and a precise point on the ocean bed chosen for drilling. When she reaches that point, she will maintain her position over the well automatically by means of dynamic positioning. All right, steer 21. 21. As the ship approaches the target, her precise position is checked by signals from a navigation satellite in orbit round the Earth. Position is uh, zero five three zero north. Yes. Four zero three eight east. Yes, I got that. Thank you. The problem now is to maneuver the ship into the precise position plotted on the chart, and then hold it there for a month or more, without anchors, under the automatic control of a computer, while we drill a well in the seabed to a depth of maybe twenty thousand feet. The answer lies in being able to provide an automatic counter thrust to every thrust of wind and current that threatens to displace the ship. First, six hydrophones are lowered through the hull in different parts of the ship. Then, 11 thruster propellers grouped in retractable turrets spread along the length of the hull are lowered through the bottom. All these propellers are reversible and are fixed at right angles to the length of the hull. Between them, they can move the ship sideways or swing it on its axis. Fore and aft movement is taken care of by the main engines. Zero five, three zero, five zero, no. One one zero, one three, three eight, eight. The last satellite position showed the ship to be within a few hundred yards of the drilling position. The captain now makes the final corrections. The room, stand by joystick. Standing by. Go on position command. Positioning command. Let her come 400 yards to port. Four. Tell me when to stop. Now the whole propulsion system, thrusters and main engines, is linked into a single joystick control. Right, let her come slowly 200 yards ahead. Forward. Stop her, you're on location now. As the precise position is reached, a taut wire is lowered onto the seabed. At the end of it is a weight and a sonic beacon, the first of several to be placed on the seabed. Taut wire on bottom. Yeah, I can see it. The hydrophones will now pick up the signal from the beacons and relay it to a computer. By comparing the information from any three hydrophones, the computer can detect any displacement and relay commands to the thrusters, which then correct the displacement. An anemometer provides continuous readings of the wind speed and direction. 
As a gust develops, the thrusters react by pushing the ship against it with just the right amount of counter thrust. The ship is now controlled by the computer and preparations for drilling can be made. Drilling where no one's ever drilled before, you don't take chances. You don't know what's down there. It could be anything or nothing at all. But what might be down there is oil or gas at a tremendous pressure. So one of the first things to be done is to lower this, a blowout preventer stack. This one's 35 feet high and weighs 90 tons. The stack goes down through a big hole in the hull right in the middle of the ship, called the moon pool. The whole ship revolves round the framework of the moon pool so that this area always remains stationary. And whichever way the sea's running, the computer can keep the ship head on to the sea and minimize her rolling. The drill string will run down through the middle of the stack. In case of operational trouble, the pressing of a button will activate hydraulically operated steel rams inside the stack that can seal the well until it can be brought back under control. On the 445, the drill string has been kept out of the derrick by stowing it horizontally on deck and then using a specially designed pipe racker to handle the pipe. When the 445 strikes oil, she will test the flow before moving on to another location, leaving it to other drilling units to appraise and develop the field in due course, and spar to produce from it. And so the move into deep water is made. Far beyond anchor depth, the first vessel of any kind to drill for oil beyond the limits of the continental shelf. The 445 holds her position over the well automatically, the computer sorting the continuous flow of data from the sensory equipment and operating the thrusters accordingly for weeks on end. The working routine of the rig going on as if nothing remarkable were happening. Take. Yes. Two pieces. All right, you have a little bit wavy. The technology at work in this ship on the stormy surface of our own planet is almost as remarkable as the technology of space and probably more important. For where the 445 drills today, a spa may float in years to come, producing oil to help close the energy gap that might otherwise threaten us all. Meanwhile, in the ship's laboratory, the petroleum engineers scrutinize the rock chippings brought up from the well searching the fossils of the past to find the energy of the future. Finding that energy in the quantities in which we are going to need it may cost us more money than we've ever spent before on any of our sources of energy. But spend it we must. One day we may be able to replace it with energy from the atom or even from the sun itself. That day is not yet. <laughs> 